Welcome everyone to section number two. This is line integrals. In this video, we want to find a slicker way to express arc length. We're going to actually define line integrals and we're going to start asking, right, what, okay, who cares, right? What kind of questions do these things actually answer for us? So that's our main topics for this video. Okay, so some things that we need to remember, and a few expansions here as well, kind of as we continue. We have a vector representation for a line segment, right? So for a line segment here, and this will come up more and more as we do problems in this section. I'm just kind of getting us, uh, you know, started thinking about these things a little bit. So yeah, we'll have to parameterize a line. Here's how we did it before. Uh, the things that we need to use really right now are we need to remember this arc length function. So I went ahead and rewrote the variables a little bit. So here's s of t, so it depends on t, right? So you start at a and you end at t sort of deal, and you integrate, and remember the arc length had the square root of the derivative squared sort of deal. And uh, if we take the derivative of this, right? So the derivative with respect to t here, well, according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? Derivatives and integrals, they cancel out. And basically the only thing that changes is everywhere you see your variable from before, so u in this case, you're gonna plug in a t. So, okay, when you take a derivative of here, right? Again, the integral cancels out, and everywhere you see a u, you plug in a t. So that's where you get this right here. Now, more explicitly, we really need differentials. Right? So differentials are related to the derivative. We just kind of, you can think of it in the Leibniz notation as moving this dt to the other side. Now again, this is notation, it's not really a fraction, but okay, this is how we got differentials back in our Calc 1 days. Right? So we can express the differential ds as the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. And with this, we can actually get a slicker way to represent arc length. Right? So the arc length of a curve parameterized by, well, some parameterization, r of t, is given by, well, you would integrate over c, and now you're going to have just one ds. Oops, that's a horrible s. One of the worst I've ever seen. There we go, one ds. Because remember, right, ds is defined up here as the square root of dx dt squared dy dt squared dt, and that was the old formula for arc length, right? We've just given new notation to an old formula. Now, likewise, now this was just for a plane up here. When you have arc length, you know, in space, right, with x's, y's, and z's, kind of this all gets upgraded as well. So now this ds would have x's, y's, and z's in it. Okay, so this is really nice, the claim is, because we can now measure all of the volume, right, whatever that means, as an integral of one. So for instance, you know, in 15.7, we said the volume can be represented as the triple integral over e of 1 dv. This would give us out volume. Likewise, the two-dimensional equivalent of volume is area, right? So if we want the area of a region in the plane, right, you can do a double integral of over r of 1 dA, right? So this would give you area, which is really the two-dimensional equivalent of volume. And then the one-dimensional equivalent of volume would be length, right? How long is something? And now we can see that we can do a single integral, right, of 1 ds. 1 ds. So again, kind of all of these volumes, these kind of natural length questions, right, can now be represented as an integral of 1. Okay, and so really quick, in order to give you kind of an intuitive idea here, I want you to think of ds as a tiny step along the curve. So again, just like dt is maybe a small change in time, or maybe like dx is a small change in x, or d, dy is a small change of y, ds is a small change in the arc length, right? It's a tiny step along the curve. So that's what you should be thinking about when you see ds. Okay, so now that we're just integrating one right here, the next question is, well, what happens if you integrated a different function, right? So for instance, we integrated things that weren't just one, you know, when we had triple integrals, and we integrated things that weren't just one, right? So any old f, when we had double integrals. And we want to be able to do the same thing now with these line integrals. And so that's where we're headed with this. If f is defined on our curve c, 
then the line integral of f along c is given by, and instead of integrating 1, we're integrating f. Okay, now if you actually want to kind of evaluate this out, right, we would start substituting things in. For instance, we would parametrize our curve. So these x's and y's would depend on the parametrization. So you'd have maybe the integral of f, and you'd have maybe x, which depends on t, and y that depends on t. And again, instead of maybe ds, you would go ahead and switch this into the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared, right? So these are your parametrizations, right? Your parametrization of your curve. You go ahead and you take the derivative of those things, you square them, throw them all under the square root, and then this is dt, right? And then your parametrization usually would go from maybe a to b or something like this. So if you actually want to evaluate out a line integral, you usually switch it over and you use this. And as promised, right, if you wanted to do this in space, right, we can upgrade this by sprinkling in these z's, right? So if you have some, a space curve that depends on maybe x's, y's, and z's, right? So, okay, you can go ahead and parametrize that. Uh, and use your parameters, and then you would have dx dt squared, dy dt squared, dz dt squared. Okay, but you can notice in both of these cases, this line integral, no matter how many components it has, x's and y's, or x's, y's, and z's, right, this is the same thing as f of, and you just plug in your parametrization, right, x of t, y of t, z of t, all right, and then you multiply by the derivative of that parametrization, right, or the, sorry, the magnitude of the derivative, right, dt. So this is really the formula that we're going to be using kind of over and over again, just because it, it works for either two dimensions or three dimensions. Okay, so again, we've now seen how can we upgrade kind of from arc length to a general line integral, but the question has to be asked, okay, who cares, right? What are these things used for? Why, do, why should I care about this? And so here's one kind of silly example here. Suppose you're a whale, right, and you're eating plankton as he or she swims through the ocean, right? And so kind of you're moving in a line, for instance, and you just naturally, you know, you don't really stop to eat plankton. You're swimming along and you just kind of naturally absorb the plankton, right? If you ever watch a video maybe of whales eating plankton, right? They don't really stop at all. They just kind of keep moving. They get stuck in their teeth. All right, so the plankton are spread all throughout the ocean with this nice plankton density function, right? So this is how many plankton there are at any given point in the ocean. You, the whale, are chilling out at 1, 0, negative 12. So the big thing here is that you're beneath the ocean, right? Maybe negative 12 meters or something like this beneath the ocean. All right, and you're about to swim in this circle right here. x squared plus y squared equals 1, and you're stay at the constant z equals negative 12. And the question is, how many plankton do you eat? And so the idea here is that you're traveling along this curve, right? And you're adding up plankton. Right, so you're traveling along the curve and you're adding up plankton kind of at each point, and you want to know how many in total do you eat. So this is exactly kind of an application of the line integral. Okay, so let's go ahead and try to evaluate this out. Well, the first step, let's go ahead and write down our line integral. So we're going to integrate over the curve C, and we're going to be adding up, right, our function is a plankton density function. So it's going to be this negative 1 over pi times 10 plus z plus x times ds. Okay, and so again, usually when we go to evaluate these things, we switch it over to this mode right here. So, okay, well, in order to do that, we need to know what our parametrization is. We need to parametrize this curve right here, right? So we think back to 13.1, and we muster all of our skills, right? And we want to parametrize this circle. And so let's go ahead and do that. I think we're going to have maybe r of t is equal to Let's see, x squared plus y squared equals 1. I think I'm going to try cosine of t, sine of t, and then z is just always the constant negative 12. So I think negative 12 here. Now let's go ahead and check, right, if you did x squared plus y squared. So cosine squared plus sine squared, would that equal 1? Definitely. Is z always equal to negative 12? Absolutely. Okay, the last thing here is that it looks like we're hanging out at this point right here. If I plugged in at t equals 0, would I get out the point 1, 0, negative 12? Well, if I plugged in t equals 0, I would get r of 0 
would equal cosine of 0 is 1, sine of 0 is 0, and negative 12 is just negative 12. So yes, I am indeed starting at the right place. And if I wanted to swim all the way around the circle, right, I would go from t equals 0 to t equals 2 pi. So this gives me my bounds of my parameterization here. All right, so let's go ahead and start plugging in our parameterization. So we're going to do integrate from 0 to 2 pi. That's our bounds here. Okay, now f of r of t. So here is my f function, but I'm going to plug in, instead of x's, I'm going to plug in my parameterization, right? So instead of x's, I'm going to plug in cosine. And instead of y's, I'm going to plug in sine. Instead of z's, I'm going to plug in negative 12. And so I'm going to have negative 1 over pi times 10 plus z, so z is negative 12, plus x, and x is cosine. So this is what the f of r of t is, and then I'm going to go ahead and multiply by the mag magnitude of the derivative of my parameterization. So let's go ahead and calculate that out really quick. So our prime of t is going to be equal to negative sine, Sine of t goes to cosine when you take the derivative, and negative 12 goes to 0. Okay, now let's go ahead and take the magnitude of this thing. So this is going to be the square root of sine squared plus cosine squared plus 0 squared, all under our square root. So sine squared plus cosine squared is 1, so this is going to be the square root of 1 plus 0, or just 1. So this is a very boring one right here, but that's a good one to start with, right? So in this case, our magnitude of our derivative here is just 1. And then we need our dt, right? So dt. All right, so let's go ahead and simplify this a little bit, and then we can integrate. So from 0 to 2 pi, let's see, 10 minus 12, that's going to be negative 2. And let's see, plus cosine of t dt. Now let's go ahead and integrate, right? This is just a constant. It's along for the ride. And when I integrate negative 2, I get negative 2t. And when I integrate cosine, I get sine. Now let's go ahead and evaluate from 0 to 2 pi. And so in this case, if I plugged in 2 pi, let's see, I'd get negative 1 over pi times all right, so we'd get negative 4 pi plus sine of 2 pi. Well, that's 0 in this case. And now subtract away negative 2, 0. So that's just 0. And we're going to subtract away sine of 0, which is also 0. So in this case, we can see that we in total eat 4 plankton. Not so great. I guess if you're the whale, but all right, fair enough. All right now you can see why I had this negative 1 over pi out here kind of somewhat contrived, but this gives us the nice, you know, whole integer number here. All right, so that's it for this video. Next time we'll see a, f well, kind of in class, we'll see a few more applications uh, for these line integrals. And, and we're also going to, you should be asking yourself, wait, where are the vector fields? I thought this was vector calculus. Don't worry, we'll get to that as well. All right, I'll see you then.